Hello and welcome to my next video on transport in plants. So firstly before this, just why do multicellular plants need transport systems? Very similar reasons to why animals need transport systems. Plant cells need substances like water, minerals and sugars to live. They also need to get rid of waste products just like we do. Um, they have a small surface area to volume ratio and so while plants could exchange substances by direct diffusion from their outer surface to the cells this would be slow so plants need transport systems very simple now there are two main types of tissues that are involved in transport in plants xylem and phloem we'll start off with xylem now xylem is long is a, has long tube like structures they are formed from cells called vessel elements and are joined end to end. There are no end walls on these tissues, making an uninterrupted tube that allows water to pass up through the middle easily. These cells are dead cells, they are not living, so they contain no cytoplasm. This means no organelles, and the reason this occurs means there's more room for water and the water is going to be uninterrupted, the same reason why there's no cell walls. You do not want the water to become interrupted, you want a nice smooth flow. The walls are thickened with a woody substance called lignin, which helps to support the xylem vessels and stop them collapsing inwards. Very similar for um, as cartilage in the trachea. It um, strengthens, supports and prevents collapse. Because when there's water and high pressure, you could have the collapse, collapsing of the xylem vessel, which you don't want. Also, since the xylem vessels actually support the plant itself, you do not want the whole plant collapsing and the amount of lignin increases as the cell gets older. Water and ions move into and out of the vessels through small pits in the walls where there is no lignin. These are pits, as you can see on the picture. Now, xylem transports water and water-soluble minerals up the plant, always up. Xylem also provides a certain flexibility in the plant as well, because you don't want it being too rigid, you want it allowed to kind of expand the lignin can be found in spiral, annular, which is rings, or reticulate, which is kind of a network of broken rings, and those are certain patterns you can find lignin in. Phloem. Now, these are slightly more complicated, but not so much. These have a main phloem kind of cell, which is a sieve tube, and they also have a companion cell. Now, the function of phloem is to transport sugars from one part of the plant to another. This can be up or down the plant, as I said at the bottom. So, while you had xylem, which was always water up the plant, phloem is up and down. And why that is, because sugars are produced in what we call sources. Now, remember, this is um, generally places like leaves where photosynthesis occurs because photosynthesis produces sugar in particular glucose but some of it can be secure um, will be converted to sucrose for transport because uh, sucrose is easier to transport than glucose and so you have this sucrose sugar and it's transported up and down to where it is needed that's the sink source is where it's produced sink is where it is used and if you think why it could go up is if it's on a leaf any leaf on the plant photosynthesizes one at the bottom lots of sugar might be needed suddenly near the top so all the sugar is transported up now sieve tubes these are joined end to end again by sieve plates these are like walls in the cells but have lots of little gaps in the sieve tube itself has no nucleus has a very thin cytoplasm which is around the outside and is connected through the sieve plates which i haven't drawn very well um, essentially it will not be like a cell and then very another very distinct cell the cytoplasm will continue throughout all of it and the cytoplasm itself will just be on the edge of the tube the middle will be empty to prevent you know clogging and allow passage up now these are living cells as well as sucrose they also just um, transport other solutes now the um, holes the holes in the sieve plates allow the uh, solutes through into each sieve tube. Now next this is the companion cell. The lack of the nucleus and other organelles in the sieve tube means that it can't survive on its own so there is a companion cell for every sieve tube. This companion cell has enough organelles to survive for itself 
and the sieve tube. Particularly mitochondria needed for active transport, we'll see why later, but it also contain lots of many ribosomes, many Golgi apparatus, all the stuff you need to survive. Now, here is a picture of a dicotyledious plant. Now we have three you need to know about the layout or design and flow. We have roots, stems and leaves. The root is the most simple. You have basically the whole of the section. You have the epidermis on the out, then the cortex, and then the endodermis. So epidermis is the black bit on the outside. In the centre you have the cortex. Then in just outside the centre circle you have another black ring. That's the endodermis. Then you have xylem and phloem. So xylem is in the centre, phloem surrounds it. So think phloem on the outside, xylem on the inside, because that helps with the next one, the stem. Now with the stem, you can see again, there is a uh, epidermis, or, you know, the outside, there's a cortex. In the centre, the green, the bright green in the centre is the medulla. And then you have phloem and xylem, kind of in that oval shape, half xylem, half phloem. Xylem again is on the inside, phloem's on the outside. And finally, the leaf. Now, the uh, vascular bundle is how we call it, but it uh, looks a little bit harder, this diagram, to see. So, if you look, we have the phloem and some. That's actually very hard to see. But if you can kind of see the blue, in the circle in the centre, the blue bit is the xylem on top, phloem underneath. So, hopefully that clear. Now one thing I haven't mentioned is meristematic tissue. Now this is certain cells that can divide, in particular something called cambium. Now in in humans or animals, it, all cells, well pretty much all cells, can divide and replicate in cells by mitosis. But in plants, the only meristoma meristematic tissues can divide. Now in the uh, sorry, stem, you have cambium, I believe it's the same for the leaf, and in the root you have pericycle. Now, the meristematic tissue in the root is just near the endodermis, that's the inner black circular ring. So it's, there's one cell layer of that. In the stem, if you look between the xylem and the phloem, there is a little white band, that is where the cambium is. And in the leaf, you can see the cambium is basically between the xylem and phloem again here. It's very hard to see on that diagram, but essentially on the leaf you have xylem, cambium, and then phloem with going from top to bottom. Xylem on top, then cambium, then phloem. Right, next. Root to xylem. This is now the transport of water. So from the root to the xylem. Right, water needs to get from the soil to the root into the xylem to be transported around the plant. Now we've looked at root cells before, they have a very long um, tip, that is for a large surface area with lots of hairs, and water is drawn into the roots down the water potential gradient. Water, as we know, water always moves from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential down the water potential gradient. The soil around roots generally has high water potential, there's a lot of water, and leaves have a lower water potential because water is evaporated from it, creating a water potential gradient. So all the time we have that water potential gradient, as I will now explain. So three pathways to look at. The dotted line is the vacuola pathway. The kind of dashed line is the symplast pathway, and the bold black line is the apoplast pathway. So, first, sort of the vacuola pathway. Now, this is very simply, it's just water moves from the vacuole to vac vacuole in each cell. It will go through the cytoplasm and the vacuole and just keep going to the xylem. The symplast pathway, water enters the cell cytoplasm only, not the vacuoles, just the cytoplasm. So it's similar to the vacuola, but it's just cytoplasm. It then passes through um, plasma desmata, that is, hol holes in the cell wall, and goes from one cell to the next. Um, once in cytoplasm, water can move through the continuous cytoplasm from cell to cell until it reaches the xylem. 
Finally, the apoplast pathway. The cellulose cell walls have many water-filled spaces between the cellulose molecules. Water can move through these spaces between the cells. In this pathway, the apoplast pathway, the water does not pass through any plasma membranes. This means that dissolved mineral ions and salts can be carried within the water. Now, if you can see on the fourth row, fourth column rather, there are some dashed lines between the cell walls. This is called the Kasparian strip. Now this prevents water passing through it, through the cell wall. So the apoplast pathway stops here and then it, all the water that's passed that way will go into the symplast and vacuolar pathway. Now what is the point of the Kasparian strip? It blocks the apoplast pathway between the cortex and the xylem. This ensures that water and nitrate ions have to pass into the cell cytoplasm through cell membranes. There are transporter proteins in the cell membranes. Nitrate ions are actively transported from the cytoplasm to cortex cells into the xylem. This lowers the water potential in the xylem so water from cortex cells follows into the xylem by osmosis. So, essentially, well firstly one thing, the cortex is from the root tip all the way to the Kasparian strip just so you know that. You'll then have, between the Kasparian strip and the xylem, some parenchyma cells, just because you need to know. Anyway, essentially what this water potential thing is, you need a, a low water potential in the xylem so water will head towards it. How do you do this? You actually transport nitrate ions into the xylem, so it, there's less water there in concentration terms, so the water potential decreases. This means in the parenchyma, you will have the um, water diffuse into the xylem by osmosis. So then in the Kasparian strip section, you have water will diffuse into the parenchyma. And it, each time water passes from, let's say, the parenchyma to xylem, the water in the parenchyma, the water potential is lowered. So that's what you're kind of doing. You're having a kind of chain of water potential lowerings. So in xylem, water potential is lowered. So water goes into the xylem lowering the water potential in the cells before it. So water goes into there, lowering the water potential in the cells before it. And one other little comment, the minerals in the root is um, absorbed by active transport. Water diffuses in, but the um, minerals themselves are actively transported in using energy ATP. Now, xylem to leaf. So once the water's in the xylem, what happens? Well, a few terms, cohesion, adhesion, and tension. Cohesion is the attraction of water molecules to each other because they form hydrogen bonds. Adhesion is the attraction of water molecules to the cell wall, um, particularly in the xylem. And tension, well that's water tension, so when you have like a pond, you know, pond, pond skaters can walk across it because of the water tension together. In particular, this is called cohesion tension theory. It relies on the plant maintaining an unbroken column of water all the way up to xylem. So what this means is, you have some water moving up to xylem, you have cohesion of water molecules together, so they're stuck creating tension, and then they're also stuck to the cell wall. Now, this occurs by transpiration. Transpiration is the loss of water by evaporation from the aerial parts of a plant, so like leaves. This, the transpiration occurs through stomata, which are gaps in the cell leaf. Now, why is this important? You, water evaporates in the leaf, and then will diffuse out of the leaf. This lowers the water potential, so water diffuses into that area of the leaf, lowering the water potential before it, so you get that chain of water potential moving in throughout the leaf then. Then, in the xylem, you've got low water potential as the water diffuses out, but more importantly, you have hydrostatic pressure. It lowers the hydrostatic pressure and thus creates tension. This Basically, the lowering of the hydrostatic pressure causes the water molecules below it to be kind of pulled up by the cohesion and adhesion, as we spoke about earlier. So, just to clarify, water evaporates from the leaves at the top of the xylem. This creates tension. It's basically suction, which pulls more water into the leaf. Water molecules stick together, so some are pulled into the leaf, others follow. This means a whole column of water in the xylem from the leaves down to the roots moves upwards. And then you've got that whole little chain back into the roots. Adhesion is also partly responsible because they're attracted to the walls of the xylem vessels, helping the water to rise up.
so you have you basically have chains of lowering water potential in the root going to the xylem and in the leaf from xylem to the end of the leaf where the stomata are and then you have low hydrostatic pressure so water is basically sucked up using cohesion adhesion and tension next measuring transpiration using a potometer now these are one of the experiments that just never work i've tried to do it and it just doesn't work because it's quite hard to actually get it perfectly right essentially you have two i suggest if you want to see the apparatus it's in the book it's quite hard to draw but you cut a shoot underwater you cut it underwater to prevent air bubbles cut it at a slant to increase the surface area for water uptake check that the apparatus is full of water and that there are no air bubbles insert the chute into the apparatus underwater so no air can enter remove the potometer from the water and make sure it's airtight and watertight dry the leaves and allow them to acclimatize and then shut the tap this is um, connected to a reservoir of water keep the conditions constant record the starting position of a fixed air bubble that will be in like when we when you do a lot of experiments you look at air bubble movement because as we said water is pulled along so the more water that is lost more water will be pulled along so you can see how far the air bubble moves and then measure it i suggest i do suggest you look at a picture of that so it makes it a little bit more clear factors that affect transpiration number of leaves a plant with more leaves has a larger surface area over which water vapor can be lost number size and position of stomata if the leaves have many large stomata then water vapor is lost more quickly if the stomata are on the lower surface water vapor loss is slower a waxy cuticle reduces evaporation from the leaf surface by a kind of insulating layer light in light the stomata open to allow gases exchange for photosynthesis in the dark they close temperature a high temperature will increase the rate of water loss in three ways It'll increase the rate of evaporation from the cell surfaces so that the water vapor potential in the leaf rises. It'll increase the rate of diffusion through the stomata because the water molecules have more kinetic energy. And it decreases the relative water vapor potential in the air, allowing more rapid diffusion of molecules out of the leaf. Because when it's very important to note that in the leaf, water evaporates first and then diffuses out of the leaf down a water vapor potential gradient not a water va well, not water potential gradient a water vapor potential gradient now that means there must be water vapor on the outside or very little as such now if there's a lot of water vapor outside the leaf not much transpiration will occur as not as there's not a great um, diffusion gradient if there isn't much vapor outside the leaf then there is a very large water vapor potential gradient so it will go down the water um, water vapor potential gradient relative humidity now this is what we're talking about high relative humidity in the air will decrease the rate of water loss this is because there'll be a small water vapor potential gradient because the air space in the leaf and the outside between sorry so if there's a high if there's a high um, humidity there's a lot of moisture in the air water vapor air moving um, air movement or wind Air moving outside the leaf will carry away water vapour that has just diffused out of the leaf. This will maintain a high water vapour potential gradient, increasing transpiration and water availability. If there is little water in the soil, then the plant cannot replace the water that it has lost. Water loss in plants is reduced when stomata are closed or when the plant shed leaves in winter. Xerophytes. A xerophyte is a plant that is adapted to reduce water loss so that it can survive in very dry conditions now water loss is unavoidable in plants as stomata are used for gas exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen so during photosynthesis plants take in carbon dioxide from the air and release oxygen now this is because of um, stomata open and closed now stomata are open in the daytime because there is light um, which is needed for photosynthesis in the nighttime they close because there is no light now xerophytes they have a lot of adaptations for living in dry conditions now the stomata that are sunk in pits so they're sheltered from the wind which helps to slow transpiration because it's more humid it reduces the water potential va water vapor potential gradient a reduced number of stomata this means there are fewer places where water can be lost 
A thick waxy, waxy cuticle reduces water loss by evaporation because the layer is waterproof. A layer of hairs on the epidermis. This traps moisture, uh, moist air around the stomata, which reduces the water potential gradient between the leaf and the air, slowing transpiration. Curled leaves. This traps moist air, slowing down transpiration. And spines. This reduces surface area for water loss. Translocation. We have talked about the movement of water in a plant. Now we're going to talk about the movement of sugars. Now, sucrose in particular. So, this is a reasonably confusing looking diagram. So, at point one, you have the active transport of hydrogen ions out of the companion cell. This sets up a... So, you have hydrogen ions in the companion cell. They are actively transported out. This causes ATP to be turned to ADP and PI, which is more important for people who are doing A2. So hydrogen ions are actually transported out, creating a diffusion gradient. They then diffuse back into the companion cell in a, using a co-transporter protein. These proteins enable the hydrogen ions to bring sucrose molecules into the companion cells. This causes the sucrose molecules to create a... Um, diffusion gradient again so they diffuse through the plasma desmata into the sieve tubes so out at one hydrogen ions actively transported out diffuse back in using co-transporter proteins and bring sucrose along sucrose then diffuses into the sieve tube so that's the uh sadly that's the kind of simple bit <laughs> almost kind of as sucrose enters the sieve tube it lowers the water potential this means water moves into the sieve tubes by osmosis. This increases the hydrostatic pressure in the sieve tube at the source. At the sink, at three, sucrose is being transported in to the uh, surrounding cells which need them because there's a high concentration at the bottom, low concentration outside in the surrounding cells. So at this is at the sink, the solutes are removed this increases water potential, so water diffuses out. This creates a low hydrostatic pressure. So the water from 2 moves down pressure gradient from 2 to 3, bringing the sucrose with it. So just to clarify, um, sucrose diffuses into the sieve tube at the source, lowering the water potential. This, creates, uh, um, this causes water to diffuse in to the sieve tube at the source, creating high pressure. At the sink end, sucrose and solutes are removed from the phloem to be used up. This increases the water potential, so water diffuses out of the sink into the nearby cells, lowering the pressure, creating a pressure gradient, so it pushes um, the water and the solutes from 2 to 3 down the pressure gradient. Evidence for translocation. Now this is, the main idea of translocation is the mass flow hypothesis now this is still a hypothesis it isn't 100% definitely proven yet but there's a lot of evidence companion cells there are many mitochondria which means ATP generation translocation is stopped by a poison that inhibits ATP formation so this this implies that energy is used we said that hydrogen ions are actively transported out of the companion cell and diffuse back in, so they need that energy. In phloem, we know that aphids will stick their kind of what we call a stylet into the phloem to suck up sucrose. So it shows sucrose is found in phloem. Also, if you ring a tree, that's kind of take off a ring of bark. The bark contains phloem, xylems in the wood. So if you remove a layer of bark, you're removing a layer of phloem. Now, what happens then is areas above the cut act as a sink where sugar collects, so there's little bulge forms, and there's no further growth below the strip, showing that sugar is not getting to the lower part, so it has nothing to do with xylem and probably has something to do with flow. Now, there are bits of evidence against the mass flow hypothesis. Not all solutes move at the same rate. Different solutes move at different rates, but if it's all going by one mass flow, it doesn't quite make sense. 
And sucrose is moved to many sinks, not just one with the lowest water potential. So it doesn't quite make sense there. But um, it's it'll be proven sometime, I'm sure. Here's a mass flow experiment. Now, A, inside A, it's concentrated sugar solution. In B, there's a weak sugar solution. Now, since A has a low water potential, water diffuses in. Now, this creates a high hydrostatic pressure, which pushes the concentrated sugar solution all the way around to B. Now, this causes the pressure to increase in B, forcing water out, which then goes along the bottom transporting water. Now this basically shows that you have sucrose, water floods in, creating a pressure gradient which causes it to go round, which is essentially what mass flow is. Anyway, thank that's that. So conclusion again with particularly with the translocation is another tricky topic in this unit. So please feel free to email me if you have any problems. So you have xylem. This transports water up the plant Phloem transports sugars up and down the plant. Water transported by adhesion, which is sticking to um, cell walls. Cohesion, which is sticking to each other and tension. In the root to the xylem, you have three pathways. The symplast, which is through cytoplasm. Apoplast, which is through cell walls. And vacuola, which is through cytoplasm and vacuoles. The rooms of water and then being um, released from the aerial parts of a plant is transpiration. Xerophytes are... Um, adapted to surviving in areas with not much water by preventing the rate of transpiration and translocation is the movement of sugars. So thank you for watching. As usual, if you have any questions, ask me. Thank you and goodbye.